Right, as usual, let's record what we have learned in the previous lecture. Um, last, in the, uh, last Wednesday, we learned semiconductor, right? And then we, we know there are three methods to do the excitation of, for a semiconductor. That means we, need, we want to know how to make semiconductor works, uh, how, how to make it work means that how do you deliver the conductivity in a um, semiconductor? And there are three methods. The first one is called photon excitation. That's what we learned on Wednesday. And the second one is uh, thermal excitation. We use thermal energy to excite semiconductor to let it work. And the third one is called chemical excitation. This is what we are going to learn today. We use um, kind of chemical method to make the semiconductor works, okay? So I think we all know this. And, uh, and we know that uh, in the end of the lecture on Wednesday, we know that the thermal energy is kind of a distribution of, is a, is a Boltzmann distribution for the molecules. You know, we regard the molecules as a kind of individual individuals so there's kind of temperature di distribution for the molecules in this room and so we and this this molecules uh followed by the the Boltzmann, the temperature of this molecules followed by the Boltzmann, Boltzmann distribution okay so um today we are going to talk about chemo excitation chemo excitation Right, so what is chemical excitation? Imagine this is a silicon or carbon. For example, this is silicon, right? Because silicon is semiconductor. And this is alternate of silicon. And then, you know, it's, it's sp3 hybridization, right? So you have one silicon and then you, this silicon connect to four adjunction silicon atoms. And the bound by, uh, is bounded using the covalent bond. So um, imagine if we replace one of these silicon to become a foreign atoms. For example, um, phosphorus, for example, boron, this kind of different atoms into this. That means the property of this material silicon change because of the foreign atoms, right? And the chemical bond changed. Okay, the energy or the bonding energy or the, the bond length of this between these two atoms are changed. So chemical excitation is called, uh, it, is, it means that the carrier injection by introducing impurities in silicon. Impurity in silicon means what? That we put, we put this in different impurities. You can put different atoms, different type of atoms, as I just told you. Let me give you an example. For example, if you have, uh, if you have rice, a portion of rice, you know, you eat rice every day, or for, for, uh, just in case, or you eat rice every day, you know, if you put sesame, sesame, do you know what is sesame? Zima into this uh, rice. That you, you can regard zima as a kind of, um, impurity of foreign atoms into this rice. I mean, it's good, right? It's good because it tastes good. It tastes better than the, the plant rice, right? So this dopant, and we can, this impurity, we call it dopants, which is good, good. Good for the rice, or good for you to eat, okay? But however, if you put, uh, you know, something like, Xiao Chang's, you know, you put, if you put Xiao Chang, baby Xiao Chang into this cockroach, if you put cockroach, baby cockroach in this portion of rice, what, what happened? You got sick, right? You don't want to eat rice for the rest of your life, right? Okay, so this is kind of contaminate, contaminate. It's not good at all. So 
That is also the baby cockroach is kind of impurity too. Right? So for impurity, you have good or you have bad. And today we are going to talk about good impurity, which is do we call dopen, dopen. So dopen is that the change the composition of the materials. So you change the, you put dopens in to replace this uh, silicon carbon, uh, silicon oton, and then the, the property change, which is good. Okay, changing the composition of material, or we call engineering materials vice chemical change. You know, if you replace this autumn, silicon autumn to another foreign autumn, chemical bond change in terms of energy, in terms of bond length. Right? So it's also we call energy engineered materials. I hope you still remember um, you heard a, a term called band gap engineering. Band gap engineering tell you that you you uh, manipulate the band gap by changing the compounds of the semiconductor. Okay. So this is also engineering. So if you put A atoms, B atoms, C atoms, foreign atoms into silicon wafer, you also change the property of this uh, silicon uh, crystal, for example. So tailored composition to give a tailored property. So you dis you you need to know what kind of property you want and you design the material, okay? So what can we change? What can we do for the silicon crystal? So introducing adiovalent adi impurities to, is to cause electron donor or electron consumption. Electron, uh, sorry, electron donation or electron consumption. So this is silicon, right? So you want to you want to change the number of the electrons. Okay, so if you want to have more number of electron, you put arsenic or phosphorus. Right? Because this group the valence electron, there are there are four valence electrons in uh 14A group, right? So there are five valence electrons in the fifteen groups in the periodic periodical table. Okay, and there are three valence electrons in a certain group, group 13, right? So if you want to have electron donation, what do you want? Which, what type of elements you need to put? You need to replace silicon atom here. If you, want to you, if you want to have electron donation, you better replace silicon by phosphorus, right? You better replace silicon using arsenic. This is called electron donation. However, if you want to have electron consumption, that means you don't you want to have one electron short, then phosphorus, oh, sorry, boron will be the one because the boron has only three electrons in a valence shell. Okay, of the autumn. So let's first, the first case, let's see that uh, arsenic, dop, uh, arsenic doped silicon and its donor energy band. So this is silicon, for example, it looks this uh, two dimension surface, you take a look of this, it is silicon. So this silicon has four valence electrons and uh, Johnson silicon also has four valence electrons. So in total, this one has eight valence electrons. It, this applied to uh, artex stability, right? So it's S2P6 artex stability. So this silicon is stable. Okay, so now you want to have, you want to replace this silicon and this band gap is 1.1 1, 1 .1 electron volt. You want to replace this silicon to become arsenic. So what happened? You have one electron extra. Am I right? Because valence electron, there are five valence electrons. So you have one, you have one electrons in the valence shell. And where will this electron be? Here or here? And how strong this electron will bound by this arsenic atom? 
That's the question you want, you want to know. That's the question I want to ask, and then you also want to know. So this is what we call extra electrons and donor. This, this electron want to give it, want to uh, attach to anywhere. So what is the energy of this, of this electrons? Energy. So let's go back to the Bohr atomic model. In the very beginning, we know that if we want to calculate this, the energy of this electron, for Bohr model, this electron, basically this electron will be minus 13.6 electron volt. I hope you still remember this number. No problem, right? This is the best, very basic uh, knowledge you want to know, you need to know. But however, this is not a single electron atom. This is not, this equation doesn't apply to this, uh, doesn't apply to this case. So we had to modify this equation. So for example, the modification of the silicon, and also it's for solid states. You epsilon zero become epsilon si, we call dielectric constant of the whole crystal. This S epsilon zero has become epsilon si, and m is the mass. <coughs> has to be modified. We call effective mass of the electron. So if, if you replace these two, the equation you got is like is the, 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 the energy, energy for this electron is about minus two, 0 0.02 0 .02 electron volt. Wow, compared to minus 13.6 electron volt, this electron only got minus two, 0 0.02 0 .02 electron volt. That means what? The, all of the electron here will sit here, will sit in the valence band. Will sit in the valence band. However, for this electron, the energy will be what? The energy will be somewhere around here. This is for you to do a simple calculation. Of course, this is a rougher. Uh, this is number is a rougher num rougher number. However, if you do the measurement the energy for this electron is about minus 0 0.045. Well, normally I, rem I just, you, you just remember 0 0.05 electron volt. So the energy of this electron, which is donor, and this electron will sit here. So this is the energy. So for the energy, so the rest of the electron, the energy, and rest of the electrons sit here and then if you want to pump electrons from a valence band to conduction band you need 1.1 electron volt right however for this donor how many energy you need to let this electron become a conduct to make this electron to be a conduction band and to make the electricity then the answer is 0 0.05 so this is much easier, right? This energy is much easier than 1.1 to pump the electron from valence band to a conduction band. And this is great. Why? Because you don't require heavy energy to make the semiconductor to become a conductor. So this is the energy. So, and then next question is how, how far does this the, the electron goes. Where is this electron? Is it somewhere here? Is that somewhere here? Is it possible to be here? Closer to the arsenic compared to the valence electron? No way, right? It must be somewhere far away from this, this one. Okay, so let's take this example. Arsenic dopant silicon as a nucleus electron and the and the arsenic nucleus to the electron distance. So how far can this electron run? Again, let's use the sim most easy case is the Bohr atomic model. For the hydrogen, you only have one electron. How far? The answer is 0 0.53 Armstrong, right? I hope you still remember this number. This is important, 0 0.53 Armstrong. Again, you use modify 
dielectric constant, you use modified effect uh, mass. We call effective mass, and you put this number into this equation, and your the lens that you found is about three nanometer. Three nanometer. So what's the distance between silicon and silicon? The distance between the silicon and silicon is about two point three five angstrom. So you have thirty angstroms. What what does that mean? This uh, the distance between this and this, this and this is about two point three angstroms, and this one is about thirty angstroms. So it's very far. You don't know where is this. It's too far. What does that mean? This this electron is not controlled by this this arsenic atom anymore. So it's very very far, and then it's not be it cannot be controlled. So the energy is required very less to become a free electron, and to, to deliver the electric electricity, right? Okay. <coughs> so this is the things that if you introduce arsenic atom to the silicon crystal, you will find out the chemical property changed, the, the conductivity changed. So let's say, let's take a look of the thermal versus the dopant energy. So more dopant atoms enter to the substrate. If I had just in another, the previous slide, I told you that if I just replace one, one atoms of the silicon to arsenic, right? You have one extra, you have one extra electrons in as a donor, and then the band gap is very, very close to the conduction band. So we have more electrons. If we put more, if we replace more arsenic, of course you got more free electrons, right? You got more electrons. That means what? You got better conductivity. Okay, so the numbers of the electrons is more, so you got better conductivity. You might say, well, Professor, can I change all? Can I change half, half? Well, in that case, it, it won't be a, a silicon crystal, right? You will, be, you will become a compound. The property, the property is completely changed. So normally you don't, put, you don't change all. You just put a dopant. For example, if you have portion of rice and you put half of se sesame into half amount of sesame into this rice. Is, do you call this rice? Do you want to eat? No, you don't, right? You just want to address this rice only, right? By sesame. And it tastes good. It tastes good. But you don't want to have too much sesame. Right, so the number of the electron is equal to the number of the host plus the number of impurities. And you know the number of the electron in the whole silicon is zero. So it's, this property is all dominated by the numbers of electron for the dopant. So P-A-N-T, -A -A dopant. Okay, so the, number of, the numbers of the electron impurity is much, much more than the numbers of host in silicon. So electrical properties are essentially lose, lose from the impurities. So now you want to control, you want to control the electricity or conductivity. It depends on the numbers of these electrons. It's not depends on number of, of these electrons in the valence band. So this is called intrinsic behavior. You know, you will know that another term is called intrinsic behavior. This is extrinsic behavior. Extrinsic behavior means that it's not the property doesn't dom dominate by the, its original properties of the silicon, but by the foreign atoms. This is called extrinsic behavior. So it also depends on dopant dependent. How many dopants? What type of dopants into this silicon? So, <laughs> undoped silicon be, it, it inhibits intrinsic. So, if you have a pure silicon, this property is uh, intrinsic. All the properties are all 
called intrinsic behavior. And because of the number of the dopant in the of the number of numbers of the electron of the dopant is much more than the numbers of the of the electrons of the uh, silicons for the thermal excitation. You know, thermal excitation is very little, right? It's ten out of minus nineteen, right? One out of ten, ten to minus nineteen. So the ratio is the probability is very low. So you know, the numbers of dopant is much much higher. So, and then we know, we also know the number of the electron is, is much more than the numbers of the electron hole. Because you have extra electrons, you don't have hole. So this is what we call supervalent dopant. Supervalent dopant. And this is also called N-type semiconductor. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to remember this, this very well. What is N-type? Semiconductor N stands for negative, negative type. So, if very soon in the next slide I will show you P type semiconductor. What is N type? N type N stands for negative. Negative means what? You have extra electrons. Extra electron means what? Electron is negative charge, right? Not positive charge. So of course you call negative N type semiconductor. Okay, so next one is called P-type semiconductor. Okay, P-type normally is what? We put phosphorus, arsenic, then this is, we have five valence electrons in this, in this column. And then we have three valence electrons in this column. So we use boron. So we replace silicon to boron. We call what? Instead of supervalent, this is called sub valent subvalent impurities boron so you change this silicon to become boron as a result you have extra electron hole here again this is impurity so this must have a higher energy right so this is called hole we call acceptor acceptor means what this acceptor this is a hole, so you can ask another electron to fill this hole. Okay? So, this hole is called acceptor. So, where is the energy of this? Is this where is the energy of this electron hole? After you do the calculation, you realize this hole is, the energy of this hole is about 0 0.05 electron volt in this, in this place. So for the electrons in the valence band, is it easy to, to make the electron jump to here? It just requires 0 0.05 electron volt. It's easy, right? How about you, you don't want electron to jump to here because it's 1.1 .1 electron volt. It's too, too much energy to consume. Okay? So if you have one electron in the valence band and then you just require very little energy, to pump this electron to here. And what happened? Conductivity, if you let electron flow, that means what? Conductivity, electrical conductivity, right? Okay, however, the number of the electron is much, much less than the number of the electron hole. So this is what we call subvalent dopant. And uh, this is what we call P-type semiconductor. P stands for positive. Positive. You know, in contrast, in contrast of the negative of the electron, this is positive. So we call P-type. P-type semiconductor. Okay. Are you okay? Are you with me so far? Yes, right. This is not difficult at all. Hope you remember. So now let's illustrate how hole move. So illustri illu illustration of the hole movement. For example, if you replace boron to become uh, silicon to become boron, you have a electric electron hole here, and this valence band, this conduction band. 
and the electron, if you have hole here, electron will move. Right? And you have a hole here, electron move. So you have more holes here, so electron will stay here, so you have more electron hole here, so electron move from left, right to left. So this is how the conductivity takes place. So I have a question for you. So this is called P-type, P-type semiconductor. And the previous one is called N-type semiconductor. So I have a question for you. Have a guess. Which one moves faster? P-type electron in the P-type semiconductor or electron uh, or hole in the N-type semiconductor? Which one moves fast? Hole move fast or electron move fast? Of course, electron, right? Electron is free. Okay? Electron is free, so you move fast. Right, so this is a kind of com uh, com comparison of the semi excitation versus chemical, chemical excitation. You know, for a semi excitation, you need to have enough energy to pump electron again from the valence band to the conduction band. So the band gap is 1.1 electron volt. So this, and if you move the electron from the valence band to the conduction band, this is called thermal excitation. For the silicon, it requires 1.1 electron volt. So unless you melt the silicon crystal to become liquid, otherwise electron doesn't move because the, 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 the temperature needs to be very high in order to move the electron from the valence band to the conduction band. However, for the chemo, chemo, chem, chemo excitation, it doesn't require large energy. So if you have a band here, if you have a band here, you can move the donor from here to here. You can move the hole from here. You can move the hole from here, electron from here to here. Okay? So please release by yourself. So after we understand the semiconductor, now the next step is how to use semiconductor to become a transistor. You know, transistor is very simple. It's like, you know, you, you want to, you, it's, just, it's just like a switch. Switch on, switch off. How do you make the transistor? How do you make a device? You can switch on and switch off. And switch on, you can regard on as a one. Switch off, you can regard the, the, the device as a zero. So it's kind of digital world, it's zero, one, zero, one. You can, you just play zero and one, that's it. Okay, so how, how are you going to do this, make this device and make it very, 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 very small? That's it. Okay, so uh, there are three giants in United States. They got Nobel Prize and it, they, are in a, they, were, they were in the Bell Lab in 1947 and they invented a, a, a first transistor and then they got Nobel Prize after 11 years later. Okay? So, um, but it's still for, too far for you to understand and we have a lecture in the graduate school. So uh, I will introduce semiconductor to you if you are interested, if you go to the semi, uh, graduate school in this university. Okay? Right, so how was how is silicon wafer? If you if you have a wafer, you can you you might you might uh, name this wafer as a p-type semiconductor as p-type silicon wafer or n-type silicon wafer. So you have p-type and n-type. P-type n-type means that you just use for uh, p is positive, right? So you use boron. N is phosphorus or arsenic. Okay, it looks like this. It can Okay, and uh, this is the cre one 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 is crystal orientation. We are going to talk about this in chapter three. Okay, uh, one zero zero is also crystal orientation. So this industry is very very strong in Taiwan, and you know we are.
proud of this industry in Taiwan because everybody knows Taiwan is very strong in this industry. It's called semiconductor industry or called VLSI, very large scale in the integration process. So you have a wafer. In the previous slide, you have wafer, which is plant. And you make, a, you make a very, very small square. It can be 200, 200 squares here. We call it chip. Chip. It's not potato chip in my thumb, okay? It's a chip in semiconductor. So this wafer can be 6 inch, 8 inch, or 12 inch. And in the future, it can be 18 inch, but you know, it's under development. I don't know whether they give up to do the, pro to do the in development or not. But anyway, now we all, the, for the high tech, we use a uh, 12 inch. Okay, this, for example, uh, if we think of this 12 inch, and if you uh, have a micro, this is before process, this is after process. After process, it can be 2000 processes, 2000 steps and to do one by one, to do one by one. And once you, you finish this, you take this out, it's like two times two square. Cheap, okay? And, the, and then if you enlarge this one out, and you will see something like this. This is called MOS. MOS stands for metal oxide semiconductor, MOS. The figure size is less than 100 nanometer, and now the more advanced technologies about what? Three nanometer in TSMC, right? And we are going to go to the two nanometer, and after that is 1.4 nanometer. Very exciting. Okay, so this is the most. So how many, this transistor in one chip, do you know how many? How many? One billion. One billion. Right, so <clears throat> let's think of the uh, integrated circuits and the discrete circuits. This is discrete service circuits. When I was young, we, I, I played this a lot. Now this is, capa this is capacitor. This is, trans uh, this is resistor. And this is, uh, this is um, transistor. So you only have three kinds of devices. One is capacitor transistor and the uh, resistor. Okay, you put these together and you, you make it like you can see, but now you have to integrate this all to become very, very small. As you can see, you can find this, this kind of, you have chip and put this to become a device. And this is CPU, as you know, the CPU. So this is a, a roadmap for the Intel's process technology. So, you know, from, from MOSFET, this is called metal oxide semiconductor fuel effect transistor. It become planar fat. Planar fat looks like this, and now it's thin fat. This is TSM, TSMC uses this technology. Samsung uses this technology. Get all around. And TSMC is going to move to this, get all around, right? You know that. Okay, so it become now it's seven nanometer, five nanometer. If you use, if you have a up to date uh, iPhone 15, that would be three nanometer, five nanometer, right? And three, uh, three nanometer uh, technology. And now it's going to move to two nanometer, and that very soon will be 1.4 nanometer technology. Right. Okay. So let me summarize the semiconductor. First of all, you need to know band. Of course, you know the band when you learn metallic bond. And because of semiconductor, you, 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 um, you learn another term called band gap, right? This, this is band, and this is called band gap. Band, 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 band gap, band, okay? For applications, photon voltaic, photon voltaic, photon voltaic, LED, and also LED. For the semiconductor, compound semiconductor, you have band gap engineering. And there are three ways to excite a semiconductor. <coughs> One is photon excitation. And using photon excitation, you can measure the band gap of those of the of the material. Another one is thermal excitation. And the 
camel excitation is the one we introduced today, right? Okay. Right, so um, let's move to the, another topic called liquid, uh, gas, liquid, and solid. How do you distinguish, how can you tell what kind of properties dominate the gas, li liquid, and solid? Okay, so um, now let's think of the gas, liquid, and solid. So you know, for the oxygen, for the oxygen, you know, if we regard oxygen, have you seen oxygen ice? You you have liquid or uh, solid oxygen, or liquid oxygen. I'm sure you have heard liquid oxygen, and you know oxygen is in the gas phase. Right, there are twenty-one percent of oxygen in this in the air, so you 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 suck oxygen into your body every day, every second. Okay, so the distance the distance between oxygen molecules are very far, and we regard it as a gas. If it's closer, oxygen oxygen molecule oxygen molecule closer to a certain distance, we regard this phase as a liquid phase. If oxygen pack, oxygen molecule pack very well, very, very, very close, there's a very little space for oxygen, and we call, regard it as the oxygen ice or oxygen liquid, a solid, sorry, oxygen solid. So what, why may this happen? Temperature, right? Temperature. If you have higher temperature, the, the oxygen is in gas. If you have a medium temperature, the oxygen becomes liquid. If you have very, very low temperature, oxygen becomes solid. So that means what? Thermal energy against what? Bounding energy. Right? I should, I should say this is kind of physical bound. It's not chemical bound. You know, we already, learned, we already, already learned chemical bound. They are ionic bound, covalent bound, and metallic bound. These are called chemical bound. But uh, there are another type of bound called physical bound. And physical bound is against if the physical physical bound against thermal energy, or thermal bound, uh, phys, uh, physical energy, uh, the energy of physical bound against the thermal energy. That means you can form solid, liquid, or gas. Okay. So formation of solid, liquid, or gas is ionic bound. Let's think of can. These three primary or chemical bond form, can form gas, liquid, or solid. Why? Okay, so the first one, ionic bond compounds, ionic crystal forms. So ionic compound can be regarded as sodium, sodium chloride, right? And then magnesium oxide, this is ionic bonding. And this is, at room temperature, this can be heavy liquid, solid, or ionic liquid, ionic liquid. How about covalent, covalent bonds, covalent compounds? Covalent compound is the bonding of molecular. For example, methane, sulfur fluoride, chlorine, chlorine and H and water. These are gas. This is liquid. So these are all covalent bonds. And the networks like solids, like um, diamond or silicon. This is covalent bond, but it's in solid. So and the metallic bond, metallical bond is lithium is solid, mercury is liquid. These are all metallical bonds. So, according to three chemical bonds, you cannot distinguish what kind of bonds form liquid, solid, or gas because ionic bond has so solid and liquid, covalent bond has gas, liquid, and solid, and then metals can be a form of solid or liquid. So you, can, you cannot distinguish this. So what kind of phenomena or what kind of force or energy can this can tell this is related to the gas, liquid, or solid form? That's what we call cohesive forces versus disruptive forces. Cohesive forces means what? The bonding energy. And uh, Destructive forces means what? Thermal energy. Okay? So, let's think of the 
bonding energy of the substance versus the general thermal energy. General thermal energy means what? The the energies, the energy surrounding the object. That's called general thermal energy. So the for the ionic crystal, for sodium chloride is about eight point one eight electron volt. So the lattice energy is eight point one eight electron volt. And how about the room temperature? If it's the at the room temperature, I hope I told I hope you still remember room temperature is about twenty five Celsius. The energy of the room temperature is about what? One out of forty electron volt, which is about zero point zero two five electron volt. So when you see this, this is thermal energy. And this is bonding energy. So since this energy is not enough, high enough to take this apart, take crystal apart. Right? Okay. How about covalent crystals? Another example is diamond. Diamond is 7.1, 7.4 electron volt. Of course, temperature is not enough. How about molecular? Molecular. This is called sulfur fluoride. Sulfur is in the in a in the middle. Fluoride, there are six for for fluoride. Uh, fluorine, sorry, fluorine autumn. The fluorine autumn is there are six fluorine autumn surrounding this sulfur. And this is if you have this and this is the gas. This is this are we call so sulfur fluoride gas. And this is big molecular. And this one H2O is small molecular. So you know that H hydrogen is very small, autumn is very small, oxygen also very small compared to sulfur and fluoride. So this is the autumn. Why? Why this is liquid? This is solid. Seems this need to be solid, right? Why this is liquid? This is solid. This is, this is liquid. This is solid. Ah, oh, sorry. This is gas. Gas. Why? So that's why we are we are here. We are talking about inter intermolecular forces. Intermolecular. We have. Intramolecular bonding. Intramolecular bonding means this is molecular, and the bonding between autumn and autumn this is called intramolecular bonding. And another one is intermolecular force or intermolecular bonding. This and this between is intermolecular. This is intramolecular. Okay. So treat. Twist what is going to on inside of the molecules between atoms, and when we when we talk about ionic bond, mechanical uh, ionic bond, metallical bond, or covalent bond, we are all talking we are all talk about intramolecular. Okay, so we use electron domain theory. I'm I'm sorry, I we, we skip this topic. Electron domain theory. So this is called primary bond. Primary bonds including, I just told you, ionic bond, covalent bond, and metallic bond. So another topic, another one, another force is in, in intermolecular forces. That means determine the state of the aggregation. State of aggregation means what? If it, aggregation means the, how close they are. If they are very close, solid. Medium close liquid, very far away to each other, gas, right? This state of aggregation. So solid, liquid, and gas. And this is what we call secondary bond. So primary bond, secondary bond. So the four, there are four, four types of the intermolecular forces. Between these, there are four types. There are four types between these bonds. Okay, so sections 2.7, secondary bondings. That's what we are going to talk now. And we need to know dipoles. Uh, we, we already know, we already, already learned the dipole, right? And the dipole in the action, that's what we are going to learn now. So there are four types. The first one is, di there are three types. The first one is dipole, dipole in the action. Or we call permanent dipole bonds. Ladies and gentlemen, these these are 
secondary bonds. Okay, it's not primary bond. Dipole-dipole interaction and dipole-induced dipole. Induce dipole. We call polar molecular to induce dipole bonds. And the third, the third one, of course, you understand, is called induced dipole, induced dipole bonds, or we call fluctuating induced dipole bonds. I'll explain this one by one to you for now. Okay, so the secondary bonding, we just quickly talk about this. The secondary bonding is van der Waal, we also call van der Waal force, or van, uh, physical bonds are weak in comparison to the primary or chemical one. So the bonding energy is small. Compared, a physical bond, the bonding energy of physical bond is smaller than the bonding energy of the chemical bond. So normally the bonding energy is, is less than 10 kilojoules per mole, which is about 0 0.1 electron volt. But of course, this is higher than the room, room temperature, right? 0 0.025 electron volt. Secondary bonding exists between the virtually all atoms or molecules. It exists, but it, it, you ignore it because the thermal, uh, thermal energy is much higher. Some, somehow, thermal energy is higher than this. Or the primary bond is higher than this. So you re but it is presents maybe obscured if any of the three primary bonds types is present. That means what? If you have primary bond, if you have primary bonds, you normally re regard this, or you normally ignore the secondary bond because this is too weak, bonding energy too weak. Okay, so now we take a look of the inner gases, a stable electron structures, then normally they are you can you can observe this very well because between this, uh, between the inner gas, there is no primary bonds, because it reach s two s two p six attack stability, right? So you can you can see the, the secondary bond well, or you can observe semi uh, you can observe secondary bond well using inner gases. Right, the types of the secondary bonds, there are two. The first one is van der Waal bonds. Van der Waal bonds. And inside the van der Waal bonds, another, there's one special bond called hydrogen bond. Okay, so you will need to remember this too. And hydrogen bond actually is a special case of the van der Waal bond. And why we have these bonds? The secondary bonding rises from interaction between dipoles. So first of all, we need to know dipoles, and then we need to, and then we move to the understanding of the secondary bonding. Okay, so dipole interaction, dipole induced dipole. Why is dipole? Why is in, induced dipole? So the electric electrical dipoles exist. Whenever there is some separation of positive and negative portion of a atom or molecule, for example, you have a atom or you have a molecule, and at that time or in some cases, there's a kind of separation of positive part and negative part. This is called dipole. So let me give you an example: uh, an induced dipole. What is an induced dipole? For example, this is a molecule, uh, is an atom. So as we know from um, the atomic model, this a uh, nucleus inside and there is a uh, electron orbitals surrounding, right? So it's a kind of electrical symmetric atom, electrically symmetric atom, okay? However, if you give this atom some kind of forces and then something happen it means that electron doesn't dispute symmetrically electron somehow move here more so we call delta minus and delta plus that means what that means we have a dipole we have a dipole 
and this is called electron cloud. Electron cloud move with something like this. So electron move more. You have more possibility to find electron in this place, and less probability to find electron here. So this is called dipole. And we can use sign like this, positive and negative. They can apply in a molecular or in a atom. So now we know, we already know this term called polar molecules. The permanent dipole moments exist in some molecules by virtue of the uh, asymmetric. Asymmetric means that it's con contracts of the symmetric, right? It's called asymmetric arrangements of the positively and negatively charged regions. Such molecules are termed polar molecules. So hydro hydrochloride is a polar molecule because you have dipole. Right? The more the electron of the hydrogen will move to the uh, will be closer to the chlorine gas, a chlorine atom. And you have past you have positive positively N in the hydrogen region, you have negative N in the chlorine region. So this is an example of hydrogen chloride. Okay, so permanent dipole rises from a negative a net positive and neg charge, negative charges that are respectively associated with the hydrogen and the chlorine ends of the hydrochloride molecule. Okay, but in term, this is neutral. Of course, of course, if you think that well, Professor, I have a positive N and negative N in both sides. And then if positive N and negative N get together, it becomes neutral. So in this molecule, this is neutral. Molecular. Right, secondary bonding forces is that secondary bonding forces rise from what? I just told you, dipole. Atomic dipole or molecular dipoles, right? This is molecular. For example, this is H2O, H2O, H2O. So you have positive N, H2O, right? So this is H2, uh, this H, this O. So you have positive N, negative N. You have po negative N, positive N. So between positive N and negative N, there's kind of attraction. So this become a dipole. And this dipole and become, make it become, have a force. So this is force, secondary bonding force, and this dipole. So when there was bonding between two dipoles, so you have dipole molecular, dipole molecular, and when there was force between two dipoles. So why they have force between two molecules, dipole, right? And why they have dipole? Why have a force? Columbic attraction, positive, negative. So the bonding results from the columbic attraction between the positive end and the negative region of the adjunction one. Adjunction means what? Neighbor, right? They are neighbors. Right. Uh, let me show you here. Example of H2O, negative, positive. Pa negative, positive. It's attraction between each other. Right. So the types of the dipole interaction is that as we just say that dipole dipole interaction, polar molecules, and dipole induced dipole molecules. For example, you have dipole molecules, you have dipole molecules. Between dipole and dipole, you have interaction. This is called dipole dipole molecule interaction. That's between the polar molecules. How about dipole induced dipole interaction? That means you have one polar molecule, for example, and then you have an induced dipole. This is an atom, for example, and there's no dipole. But this was induced by this molecule and it become a dipole. So there's a between there's an interaction between dipole and induced dipole. And this is this is called dipole induced dipole interaction. 
How about induced dipole, induced dipole interaction? This is very interesting. So how come you can have an induced dipole? You can have two induced dipole. The force are temporary and fluctuating with time. And we are going to talk about this. I don't know whether we have time today or not. Maybe not. We might talk about this next week. But let me start from the first topic. The first topic is dipole-dipole interaction. Permanent dipole bounds. This is easy. I just, as I just want to tell you, let's, again, let's make an example of hydrochloride. The hydrochloride, they have one hydrochloride. And this is a dipole molecule. Right, this is a dipole molecule. And we understand you have the positive end in the hydrogen order. You have negative end in the chlorine order. And then assume if, if you have another hydrochloride which is close enough to the, another one. And this will be positive end, negative end. And what happened to these two molecules? Interaction, right? And make a secondary bond, and we call Van der Waals bond. So between each other, there is an attraction force. If you have force with distance, you make energy. So interaction occurs on, only between polar molecules. So this is called dipole-dipole interaction. Okay, and then you have a third one. You have force one. And you make something like this. But of course, you make it as a line or you make it as a two-dimensional distribution. You make it as a three-dimensional distribution of the hydrochloride. You can make bounds. And this is called Van der Waals bound. Easy, right? Easy. How about energy? When you want to think of energy, is that it's about it's less than five kilojoule per mole. This energy is very less. The bonding is weak compared to the chemical bond. Secondary bond is always weak. Uh, it's kind of a proportion of this type of energy of dipole dipole interaction is a is a kind of a proportion of mu. Mu is dipole moment. And R is interpolar separation. Interpolar separation means this one. How far? If it's too very close, energy is strong. That's for sure. Right? That's for sure. If it's R is too far, energy is low. It makes sense. And as you know, temperature is what? This is bounding energy. This is thermal energy. Of course, bounding energy will against thermal energy. So temperature high, bounding energy will be low. I don't need you to remember this equation, but I want you to know the concept of this equation. For example, distance between here and uh, temperature between here. So in Kahoot, I might say that, well, tell me the energy related to distance, distance between molecules and also the temperatures of the environment, environmental temperature. And mu is Q times D. D is the dipole separation. Dipole separation means what? This is dipole between the in, intra, uh, intermolecular. This intramolecular. Okay? Dipole separation here. You know, mu is here. This is the dipole charge. How many charges? And D is the distance between here. I is distance between here. So I make the mark here for you. Again, I don't want you to remember this equation, but I want you to know the concepts. So when the temperature is low enough, so temperature very, very low, like very, 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 very low. So the, the thermal energy will not dis disrupt the bonds, and then they are forming by the dipole-dipole interaction. So the thermal energy, energy low, the bonding, you can see bonding easily. So if the bonding, bonding you, temperature low, that means the bonding, you can see the bonding and you can make it become solid, liquid or solid, right? So let me make an example for you. This is hydrochloride. Hydrochloride gas, hydrochloride liquid, hydrochloride solid, and uh, aqueous hydrochloride solution. So 
This is the one you always use. This is what we call yen xuan, right? In Chinese, yen xuan. Okay, so what's hydrochloride, hydrochloride gas? At room temperature, it's hydrochloride gas. So when you open yen xuan solution, you know the vapor come out, that's hydrochloride gas. Okay? Be careful, don't suck it, okay? You have serious problem. You should, you know, you are chemical engineering, engineers. You know how to treat the chemicals. So if you, if you reduce the temperature down to uh, minus 85 Celsius, it becomes liquid. So liquid means what? Liquid means they are far away. And originally in gas, they are very far away. The, the, the molecule between each other, they are very, very far away. But if you reduce the temperature, they are closer. Because of what? Because this, this temperature, thermal temperature, thermal energy is too low. There's no enough energy to pull this away. Okay, and the bonding, you can see the bonding, right? You can see the bondings. So in the liquid, so it's the distance between chlorine molecules is, mo is closer. However, if you reduce the temperature down to 115 Celsius, minus 115 Celsius, and it becomes solid. So the thermal energy is low enough and the temperatures below this value is weak interactions dom dominates. Weak interaction between molecules means that dipole dipole interaction dominates this situation. So this becomes solid hydrochloride. So they are much closer compared to the molecules are much closer compared to the liquid. Okay, so this and this time dipole dipole force is greater than thermal energy, thermal force or thermal energy. Another case is, is um, hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is that, uh, you know, this hydrochloride will be taken apart. The hydrogen uh, proton will take apart, to, uh, will join the water, right? This is different, okay? When you see this, this is different compared to this and this and this. Okay, so this dipole-dipole interaction I just told you. Of course, you have attractive force and you have repulsive force. Right, so permanent dipole bond is that the Van der Waals forces exist between a junction polar molecules, like as I just showed you, hydrochloride, hydrochloride molecules. And associated bonding energies are significantly greater than the bonding involved induced dipole. So this kind of dipole, this kind of energy is energy of this kind of dipole and bound is greater than induced dipole. What we are going to show you very soon, okay? So these are the example of the dipole-dipole interaction. I just make a hydrochloride as a molecular, for, uh, as an example for you. And this is also, for example, polymer. Polymer is a kind of hydro, a long chain of the hydrocarbon. And this is hydrocarbon chain, hydrocarbon chain. Between hydrocarbon chain, these are chemical bonds, right? Car the chain, chain here is carbon, uh, chemical bond, but between bonding, this, this chain and this chain is inter interaction, this is secondary bond. Right, I think um, I run out of my time today. I want to talk about this to you, but unfortunately, I don't have time. I will leave this for the next week. Okay, dipole induced dipole interaction. Okay, so I think uh, I better stop here today.